there's a connection card, and that connection card gives us some basic information. If you're a first or second time guest, we would welcome you to fill that out and take it back to the Welcome Center where we have a free gift for you. It's a gift bag, it's other goodies inside, and we'd appreciate you filling that out. Um, and so thank you for that. If you're a, a regular, if you come all the time, also on that connection card is a great place to be able to put uh, prayer requests, ways to get more information about different ministries here at the church. And so. Uh, that is the place to do it. So please fill that out, put it in the offering plate later as you exit, and uh, we'd appreciate that. So this morning we get a chance to observe Lord's Supper. And so we're looking forward just to doing that. And it's a, a, we have a, a really powerful video that we wanna, we wanna show you as we lead into Lord's Supper. And so I, I would just uh, ask you just to reflect on this video, uh, just take, take it all in as we, as we get prepared to do this.
And um, it may not mean much coming from uh, just a friend or just an acquaintance or whatever, but as the God of the universe who knows everything about you, who knows everything, every sin that you'll ever commit, still chooses to love you, still chooses to love me, and, and pays the ultimate sacrifice for that to happen. Jesus comes and drinks the cup of wrath that we deserve, and then allows us to have his righteousness as a gift. And that's it's an amazing idea. His sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice, was completely sufficient to pay for the sins of the entire world. But forgiveness only comes to an individual when he or she repents and believes. Man. And so have you, with your freedom, said yes to that, that gift? Or have you, with your freedom, said, no, I, I, I don't want that? That's the question this morning. That's the question that is the question of life. And so as the deacons pass forward the, the sacraments, we, we look forward just to uh, celebrating what Jesus has done. And it's a position of our church that if you, if you are a Christian, if you have aligned your life with Jesus, if you, if you had said, have said yes to him, we welcome you as part of the family to join in the Lord's Supper this morning. Jesus has done for you. May that 
that be the reason that you sing the songs we're about to sing. May that be the reason that we're here this morning as we celebrate Jesus and who he is. May we proclaim that this morning together. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Father God, we recognize that all good things come from you. We thank you that we're able to come and gather together and that we can celebrate and remember all the things that you have done. That you and you alone were able to drink that cup and, and take away all the sin of the world. And we recognize that it's only through you that we have salvation. We can't do enough good. We can't just be good enough. But, but through you, we can have salvation. And we celebrate the fact this morning. May we sing to you, knowing that fact, rejoicing in that fact. In Jesus' name.
we're so thankful this morning that we can worship you. And God, we thank you that even though we were headed towards death, that we were headed towards just a life of emptiness, of hopelessness without you. God, that when Jesus came and he died and he rose, that everything changed. And we're thankful for that change this morning. God, this is why we worship you. And as we partook of the Lord's Supper this morning, as we remembered your death, your sacrifice, God, God, I just pray that you can overwhelm us with the love that you have for us and that we can just respond in worship, that we can respond on our knees because of who you are. We praise you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll continue our series, Scars. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about scars. And as you know, when you get a scar, that means that there's been an event, a traumatic event, maybe, or whatever. You've fallen off your bike or you've had surgery, and that scar means that there's been healing. So you can point to that and show healing and tell your story. And also, one of the things that we know, if we've done life long enough, that the most visible scars aren't the ones that hurt the most. The scars that are the deepest ones that no one can see are the ones that there's been deeper healing or that need deeper healing. And so we've been talking about those scars over the last few weeks, and we'll delve into that again this morning. And this morning, we're going to delve into the scar of depression. And so there are sermons or messages or talks or whatever you want to call them that I wish that I could give you A plus B equals C, and you could walk out of here with a nice little package that's got a bow on top of it, and you go, Pastor Chris said, if I feel depressed or I struggle with depression, I can take this box and open it up, and this will, from the Word of God, will transform me, and I won't have to deal with that. Well, that's not today, okay? So what I want you to grasp this morning is this is a growing Concern. This is a growing issue in our culture, this thing called depression. And let's be honest about it. Let's dig into it and, and see that God's word does speak to it. But how can we grasp it? And what is what is it? And, and what can we do with it? And how can we move forward in the midst of struggling with this idea called depression? So there's a... a lame, I call it a lame definition because it's it expresses it. But there's so much more to it. So depression is this, a common, almost like a common cold, like I've got today, a common and serious medical illness that negatively impacts how you feel, right? Impacts the way that you think and the way that you act. So the depression is that something happens inside of here that transforms you in such a way that negatively you begin to feel, you begin to think, and you begin to act in a way that's different from before. And so there's some unhealthiness about this. And so I want us to, to think about that and to dig into that. And, and again, this is one of those messages. Even I've had this happen once or twice in my life of preaching is that there's so much stuff to dig into that we just kind of have to call time out and say next week we'll come back to part B and finish the message. And so we're going to dig in, and if we don't finish, we'll come back next week. Is that okay? Because yeah. I know some of you will you will um, run out at 12 o'clock because you have lunch plans. All right? So here we go. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. And in just a minute, we'll get there. Depression, even though it's a common experience, the causes are varied and unique. So I, I want to take just a moment and lest you think that Pastor Chris is talking about a topic that he doesn't understand or grasp, I want to pull back the curtain a little bit on my life and let you in on something that only three people know about, before today even my children didn't know about, is the moment that I sat before my good friend, the medical doctor, and said, hey, this is something I think that I'm struggling with. As a matter of fact, I didn't even make myself go to the doctor. My spouse did. So here we were in the midst of life, and we were planting a church. So planting a church doesn't mean that we're putting a seed in water. I mean, we're starting a new church, so there's this entrepreneur. So like any other business, whenever you say you're starting something, you're all in, right? 
And so God, we felt like God had called us to plant a church near Columbine High School. That's in the area that we had lived in for almost 15 years. And so we felt called to that area. And we were a part of a larger church, and we were driving 30, 45 minutes to a different church and serving there. But we really felt like God was opening up doors for us to impact the area around Columbine. And so as we began to do that, pray through that, through that, 40 people, about 10 families or so, said, hey, we want to join with you and where we feel like God's leading. And so 40 people joined with us, and we started a church. And so we began to meet in a school. And so as a part of that whole meeting in a school and doing this every single Sunday, so every single Sunday, we would gather together, and someone would drive the big truck with the big trailer, and they would open the back, and we would unload the sanctuary, we would unload the nursery, we would unload the children's area, we would unload the youth group. I mean, <clears throat> it's a church in a box, all right? And we're unloading it every single week. That gets tires. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we're doing this whole thing, and in the midst of that, because 40 people together weren't able to feed my family, we're doing everything and anything we can to start this business and also feed the family. So I'm traveling to churches and saying, hey, look, we, we need you to be a part of this. This is what God's doing. And selling that, I had a whole business plan, church planning thing, and all that different stuff. And going through all that, and at the same time, I'm teaching classes at Colorado Christian University, and, and those are in seed and they're online. And then I'm also working at Target, and I'm also coaching a softball team. I'm also coaching a baseball team. And oh, yeah, I have a wife. And so we're going, and so if you have, imagine if you have a candle and your life is a candle, if you would have one light going, I cut it in about six different ways and was trying to get all of these lights going and trying to manipulate and use them in the proper ways. And so there came a point in the midst of all of this that we grew from 40 to over 300, yeah. wow. which is incredible, and over 100 baptisms. So God was doing something in the midst of that, and then the next thing I know, a couple of years in, one of my good friends came to me and said, hey, I'm done. I don't want to be a part of this thing. It's moving too fast. I, don't, I can't keep up. Like, I know I can't either. So that was the first hit. Somebody I trusted was out. So then a couple of others, man, Chris, I can't, I can't keep this pace. I can't do this. And I'm like, look, God's doing something. Why are you bailing from the ship? So after a little bit, you know, a few months, Becky came to me and she said, hey, there's something that's not right with you. She goes, I love you. I can see it. You're, you're not sleeping and all these different things. And she goes, I know you got to check up real soon with the doctor. Let's, let's, you go to the doctor. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'll go get it. So we went there and sitting, sitting in the doctor's office again, a great friend of mine. And he goes, hey, your blood work looks good, you know, your stuff, you know, you're, you're still short, you still have no hair, <laughs> you can lose a few pounds, I'm like, yeah, 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 that's 2012, you know, whatever that is, those things are going to happen. <clears throat> Anything else? I'm like, nope, everything else is good. And my wife goes, <clears throat> actually, he has something to talk to. I'm like, I do? <laughs> yeah. Because I think you might be struggling with depression. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I'm type A. I've got the answers. I've got the solutions. We're moving. We're going. We're grooving. Everything, this is just a little temporary setback. And she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This has not been a two-week thing. This has been a two-month, three-month, four-month thing. I'm seeing this train tracking faster and faster and faster to destruction. So my friend, the doctor, pulls out that DSM thing. It says, do you feel X sometimes? Are you not sleeping? Yeah. I mean, you know, five out of seven nights, it's, I get two nights of sleep. You know what I mean? And so here I am, even in the midst of this, rationalizing all of this. And he says, you know, you might be there. So type A perfectionist person, never fail, never want to admit anything, is in front of my wife and a good friend saying, in that moment, feeling like I failed. Because how can God be doing this 
and doing all this miraculous things. I mean, seeing 80-year-old women that have grown up in the Catholic Church that have been oppressed by lies say yes to Jesus and be baptized, and adult men giving up stuff and being falling in, into the baptism, and just this life change, and in the midst of that, me saying, I have no hope. Because in the midst of all that, for me, as I've looked through this and studied it, I've became moved from being someone who's pointing people to the Savior to thinking that I was a part of the Savior. So the weight and the burden of ministry and of life and of husband and of father and of all of this was on me. It just kept getting heavier and heavier and heavier. So this morning when we think about this idea of depression, I want to just to, the causes are different and varied, but that experience in so many ways is similar as if there's a sense of hopelessness, there's a sense of aloneness, there's a sense of rejection, there's a sense of, of worthlessness. I mean, you put the words, you've, you've experienced it, well, you've got it. And, and as research shows us, it's been something all throughout history that 99% of us deal with in some way and probably the 1% that says that they haven't dealt with it don't want to admit it. Because we're humans and there's messes and there's those moments where life overwhelms and so we struggle with this thing called depression. And so if you were to actually look in scripture, you can't find depression. But if you were to kind of open up what are those things that describe depression, the scripture is overwhelmingly giving us, giving us words of hope and of wisdom about what it means to suffer. So as I've studied this thing called depression, one of the things that come back to is that maybe even a better word is suffering. That we're suffering through and walking through what it means to live life where we're at in the season. In a cave part of our season of life. Suffering is depression. The feelings of being sad and empty. The moments of losing interest in those things that once drove you now don't have anything for you. Maybe you've lost weight or maybe you've gained weight. There's those moments of insomnia or even hypersomnia where you just can't, you're constantly going. You fatigue easily. Those moments that you, the alarm clock goes off and you keep pushing snooze and you keep pushing snooze and you keep pushing snooze until the point you're like, you turn off the snooze and you just hold on the sheets and you're like, if I don't have to get up, if I don't get up and I don't have to make a decision, and if I don't have to make a decision, and then you just go through the whole thing and so you just decide that today's a day where I'm just going to be here. The feelings of worthlessness, the feelings of guilt, and all of those things that go in, the inability to think clearly and to concentrate, to the, the indecisiveness that comes. And so again, you just want to just shut it all down. Now, I admit I never got to the place of thinking about taking my own life. I would say I had a mild depression that I was able to make some changes to lifestyle and schedule. And so I've learned and I'm continuing to learn as a type A person to say no to more things than I say yes to. So that I just have one candle and there's only one me and I can only do so many things. And so if I, usually if I tell you no, it's because I, I, I can't do it. There's only one of me. And so this whole thing of, of thinking through life and one of the lies that I had bought into was that I could solve everything and be involved. And I knew that to not to be true, but I was there. So depression comes from our suffering. But where does our suffering come from? Our suffering comes from other people. Right? I mean, those are the deepest scars sometimes. It's because we've done life with people and we've entrusted them. And the longer we do life with people, the more we trust them. And then somewhere along the way, maybe someone has cut us and cut us deep. So other people can cause that scar. And so we don't trust anymore. And so instead of the very thing that we should be running to, which is community deep, we run away from community because we don't want to offer ourselves to others to be trusted to, so we run from it. So other people cause us to enter into suffering. We ourselves cause suffering, whether through our addictions or through the decisions that we make, that we have a tendency, maybe even because we've been hurt by others, that we keep others at distance. And so as soon as we sense that someone's going from here to potentially a hugging distance, 
that we push them away and we break those relationships because we don't want them to hurt us again. So it's easier for us to control the hurt rather than them hurt us. So we keep people at a distance from us. And then I hear that getting older is like a train wreck. That you can see it coming and the luggage is breaking down and falling off and you can see it coming but there's nothing you can do about it. Because the body is failing. That no matter how much or whatever, that at some point it's going to hurt to get up. It's going to hurt to sleep. It's going to hurt if you sleep too much. If you don't sleep enough. If you, you know what I mean? I mean, all this sort of stuff. And so the train wreck is going and there's nothing you can do. You're just on the ride. And so your bodies are failing. And so we grieve that the body is failing. And so again, it's suffering that happens. Another cause of suffering in our life is the evil one, the devil, Satan. In 2 Corinthians 11, 14, it says that he is the father of lies. So if he is the father of lies, one of the things that he does to us is he speaks untruths to us that are close to the truth. And it's close enough to the truth. It's close enough to the light that we receive it. And then when we receive it, then we begin to act on it. And so then when we begin to act on it, then it becomes a part of us. And so then all of a sudden, we're that one degree off. And all of a sudden, we're in a place that we don't want to be. And so those lies hurt us. Those lies that we hear about ourselves, that you're not smart enough, you're not strong enough, you're not whatever, that you believe and you take in and you receive it, and therefore you live life out of it. The lies that you believe about God that are true, that God is a good God, but then you believe that, but then something happens and you, all of a sudden you act in a way that's completely opposite of that, that you think that God's out to get you when he's not. Because if he's your good father, then he's protecting you. And all the different lies that we believe about God, or even the lies that we believe that life owes us something, that we have this American idea that, hey, I'm going to get to a certain place, and I'm going to make a certain amount of money, and I'm going to have 2.5 kids, and 2.5 cars, and a picket fence, and a two-story house and would be comfortable and all those different things and so that you're going to have a 401k and all these different things that you think are going to be a part of life expectancy and then all of a sudden it gets pulled out from underneath you and the very thing that you had put your hope in that you didn't even realize maybe you had put your hope in is pulled away from you and now you're questioning God why God and God's like not part of that you placed your hope in and then worship your 401k or your whatever, and so our life expectancy sometimes, the things that we expect from life get pulled away from us. Also, one of the things that, this is an interesting idea, is that sometimes our suffering is actually God allows it. That maybe even God is the source of it. Now, that's a whole other message and a whole other thing, but and throughout the Old Testament, God says, I'm the one that brings rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I bring good and I bring suffering. And so there's this, this idea. And so we ask that question of how can God be the source of that? And well, in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James kind of gives us a glimpse and says, listen, God is the source of those things because, one, he's a good father. And it sounds anti-good father, but he's in those things with us. And that the, the trials, the temptations, the suffering of life, he's there with us. So as the impurities of life, of our messiness is brought to the top, God cleans that out. And so he's using that stuff for a purpose and for a greater means. So that tomorrow we look a little bit more, we talk a little bit more, we think a little bit more, we act a little bit more like Jesus tomorrow than we did today. That, that actually throughout scripture there's a, a theology of suffering. Because we live life. And that scripture is relevant to life. And so it talks about that suffering will come. Suffering is a part of life. What are we going to do with it when we're in the midst of it? So those other causes of suffering and depression in our life. But one of the things that I do want you to grasp is that God understands our suffering. Think about Jesus. The very first thing that Jesus did to begin his ministry was to go out into the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is led out into the wilderness. And it wasn't even necessarily Jesus' idea, but he went out there because the Spirit, it says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And when he was led into the Spirit by the wilderness, he was hungry and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and one of my favorite duh moments in scripture, what does it say? He became very hungry. Well, duh. He didn't eat for 40 days. He drove by Whataburger and said, no. Right? 
He drove by places and he didn't do it. He didn't eat, but he was out in the wilderness and he didn't eat for 40 days and became very hungry. I think it's interesting that the beginning of Jesus' ministry is very much like how the nation of Israel moved into the promised land. They were 40 years wandering in the desert in the wilderness and God consistently provided for them. And here Jesus, after 40 days of hungering and wanting, he's desperate. Right? 40 days of not eating. He's desperate. And so Satan shows up and says, I can ease your suffering if you would just do this. And Jesus consistently goes back to the word and says, no, my father says, no, my father says, no, my father says. And so for us, understand that Jesus says temptation. He understands our suffering. He was desperate for the physical things. He understood what it meant to be in need. Then also his life and ministry, everywhere he went, he was attacked, he was mocked. The religious people of the day, their very pursuit was to say, you are not the king of kings. You don't match up with our description of what we think the king of kings is going to be. And so they were constantly pursuing him. And so his life and ministry is described as a man of sorrows and the suffering servant. So that his thing, we think that he just went from place to place and it's like, oh, Jesus is coming. Yay! And everybody was around and they put up the stuff and served Now, he was the suffering servant. So think of, that's his title. One of the titles of him is he suffered. He lived human life. Even in his death, he's on the cross and the crowds gather around and they mocked him. His disciples had left him. So he's alone, he's rejected, he's an outcast. And people are screaming at him, making fun of him, talking to him, and, 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 and all this. And so even at his very death of where he drank the cup of wrath for us, he was suffering for us. So God in his humanity understands the depths of our suffering. If to, under, to go through the depths of suffering that he went through, surely he can understand Ours. He's not, a, he's not a God that doesn't understand us. No other religious teaching, no other world religion has anything like this where like God stepped into our world and experienced life with us. 1 Kings chapter 19, we see another servant who'd experienced the great high of serving with Jesus. And this is one of the things that is studying depression and thinking through this idea is one of the things, especially for us as Christians, is we experience some high, we experience this thing, and so all of a sudden something happens. And so we're, we're kind of in this unpenetrable, we're not vulnerable, we're Superman or whatever that is. And so we're kind of like, yay, God, look what I did when God's done it, Right? So here's Elijah. The story of Elijah is he was a prophet, and he had done some miraculous things in a time. And, and so here he is at this one point, and there were all these prophets of Baal and Elijah. So Elijah and the prophets of Baal said, hey, let's go up to the top of this mountaintop, and we're going to see whose God is the greatest God. It was kind of a fun thing. It would be a great movie. And so Elijah and these prophets go to the top, and Elijah says, look, here's, here's the deal. You, you put up an altar like you do to, to your God, Baal, and to worship. And then after you're done and your God doesn't show up, I'll do mine. And so the prophets of Baal do that. They do their whole thing. They set up the wood, kind of get all that stuff there, and they're, they're there. And so they begin to chant and do the different things that they do to call on their God. And after a few hours, the prophets of Baal aren't hearing from God. And so then Elijah spiritual cynicism or sarcasm begins to say, hey, where's your God at? What's your God? Is your God asleep? Maybe your God's on a bathroom break. Seriously, your, your God's up. So you just begin to do call out loud or do something so you can wake him up and get his attention. And so they do this. And so after a certain time, they're just kind of worn out. And Elijah's like, are you done yet? Like, yeah. So Elijah tells the people, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put together the altar and I want you to put the wood, here's what I want, and then I want you to bathe it in water, soak it in water, and create a moat around it so that just the water pours off and that there's no doubt that when my God does what he does here in a minute, that you're going to have no shadow of a doubt that my God is the true God. So they do that. And then Elijah says, God, show them that you're God. That's my own translation. Burns it all up. 
the rocks, the water. It's literally, it says it was like the tongue reached out and just burned it and it was gone. And immediately the prophets of Baal were scared because they were in the presence of the Holy God. Now nothing had changed, right? But now they're, they're aware of the fact that they're in the presence of the Holy God. And so Elijah like begins cutting them down and they begin to run and he chases them. And so all this, he's excited, like, yeah, God, look what we did, look what we did. And then here comes this woman who apparently is scary. I think of her like as Cruella de Vil. <laughs> Came up to Elijah and said, Elijah, I'm going to get you. And so from this mountaintop high with God, all of a sudden someone speaks something to him. And a lie somewhere in the depths of his heart takes root in that moment when she says, I'm going to get you. And so from being here and worshiping and excited, he runs away from her. So get your Bibles, 1 Kings chapter 19, starting at verse 9. Or actually, let's do verse 8. <coughs> Excuse me. So he got up and he, he ate and he drank. And the food, he gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights. That thing keeps showing up, doesn't that 40 <laughs> thing? God likes 40 days and 40 nights. And so the mountain of God... And there he came to a cave where he spent the night. You see, that's, that's the struggle. It is the very moment that he should have pushed into community, that he should have pushed into the other worshipers. He ran because of the lie. He ran to a place, the cave, the darkest place he could possibly find. Even the mountain of God where we receive the Ten Commandments, where God had shown his face, he runs to the cave and he hides. If you've been into a cave, the darkest cave, you can't even see your own hand in front of your face. And so that's, some of that is that, that suffering, that depression, is that we move and we run. When we run, should run the community, we run to the darkest place because we don't want to deal with those around us. We don't want to deal with God. We don't want to deal with, and so we run to the cave. But the Lord said to him, even in the suffering, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. That's that moment of isolation and of that worth and the sense of what he's feeling in that darkness and he's struggling with it. And then here's God talking to him in verse 11. Go out, stand before me on the mountain, the Lord said. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. And it was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And again, God is pursuing him and he asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And here Elijah's cry again. He replied again, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you and torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. The isolation, the darkness. There's no one else. I'm the only one. No one else has experienced this. No one else has these feelings. No one else is depressed as I'm depressed. No one else is suffering like I'm suffering. No one else has lost their job like I've lost their job. No one else's divorce is as messy as my divorce. No one else's kids are as messed up as my kids. No one. We got to run to the cave. And we hide and we don't want to struggle with it. But the beauty is, is that God sees us in the darkness of the cave and calls out to us and says, where are you? I want you to come. I am in relationship with you and I want to experience this with you. I want you to know. I want you to hear. And even the things that, that show up that we think are God, God whispers. Because for someone to whisper everything else, you have to stop and intently listen. God speaks deep things in those quiet moments. You're a word. I love you. You're called. Look, look what he says. In verse 15. Then the Lord told him, 
Go back the same way. The same way that you came and traveled to the wilderness. It's not the place he wanted to go, but he sent him back the same way that he came. And when you arrived there, anoint Haziel, the king of Aram, and then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, the king of Israel. These are exciting names. I know you're excited. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Malaha, to replace you as my prophet. In other words, I'm not done with you yet. Go back from where you came from. I have stuff for you to do. You are chosen. You are called. And I know that it's tough right now. But I want to call you out of the cave with a gentle voice. And I want to move you to the place that I want you to understand that I have something for you. You are my child and you are not junk. I don't make mistakes. Let's grind this out you have a specific call that only you can do. Because the things that God asked Elijah to do, only Elijah could do. And there are things for us that in those moments where we want to pull back from community, the very thing that we need to be doing is pushing into community because people need you. They need your story. They need your experience. They need your gifts. They need your talents. They need you to speak into their life and say, this is where we're at together. We're going to go capture the world for Jesus Christ together. And it's not going to be easy. It's not an A plus B equals C, but we're going to grind it out because God is not done with us yet. Verse 17. Anyone who escapes from Haziel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Here's the victory for Elijah and Elijah. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal and kissed him. In other words, there's 7,000 other people just like you, Elijah. I know that you think that you're alone. I know that you think no one else is going through this. And I know that you've experienced something that no one else has experienced. But as worshipers, there are 7,000 other people that are crying out in the same way that you are. And I've heard your cries. Find that place of worship. Press in the community. Press in when you want to run and when you want to hide. Verse 19. So Elijah went and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. In other words, this dude was rich. So most people, if they had one, but he had a bunch, so just a big old train line of oxen before. So he had a lot of money, so whenever he's getting a call from God, he's getting a call from Elijah, he has a lot to give up. And Elijah went over to him as he's plowing, and he threw his cloak over his shoulders and walked away. And Elisha left the oxen standing there and ran after Elijah and said to him, First let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. And Elijah replied, Go on back. But think about what I've done. So Elisha returned to the oxen and slaughtered them and used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast the flesh and passed them around the meat to the townspeople. They all ate. That's a barbecue. I mean, that was like, everybody's like, Woo, party. In the midst of that, to say, then Elijah went with Elisha. Elisha went with Elijah as his assistant. <laughs> the very place that he was running away from was the very place that he needed to be. That God provided for him a place to worship and it showed him that there are other people that are in the exact same place that you're in that need to be worshiping together and you need community. Listen. B equals C that ends your suffering. Whatever your suffering is, whatever it has been, whatever it is, or whatever it's going to be, there's not an A plus B. So here's what I understand, and here's what I know, and here's what I've experienced. When I press in to community, and those that I can trust in those deepest, darkest moments when I run, run to the cave, I need to run to the home of those that are my 2 a.m. friends. And say, this is what I'm struggling with. This is where I'm at. This is what I'm suffering with. And that in those moments, that's when we're most in depth worshiping. Because we're worshiping with one another. That's the moments that we're most like God with one another. Because we're in it together in the moments of the mess. And that we're vulnerable. And that our joy is in Christ. But we're still that mess. 
So are you suffering or are you struggling? If so, the first thing to do is tell someone, tell someone, tell someone. Tell someone. Get out of the cave and tell someone. The other thing to do is if you don't have that type of friend and you can't do it, we have a counselor here that would love. There's money doesn't keep you from doing counseling here, so if you need it, call us and we'll get you in. You need to talk to someone. You need to have community. You need to have someone walking with you in that. Maybe even more than that, you need to go see your doctor and talk to your doctor, and your doctor can work through some things with you, and you need to do that stuff. Let's not admit that there's chemical imbalances and different things. Again, this is not an easy solution, but there are solutions. There is hope. There is victory. There are others that we can fight and grind together. The other part is, as a follower of Jesus, keep pursuing God. Don't give up on worship. Don't just say, why God? Why would you allow this to say, what God? What, where are you? What do I need to be? Where do I need to be? Who, where? And begin to worship. And there's something that happens in worship when we begin to say, I'm not the Savior. I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers. I can't do it all. And the mirror begins to change from here to up there. And we realize that he is worthy. So our perspective changes. And also, I think the most difficult thing maybe to do of all of this is to do community. It's to truly do community with someone. It doesn't have to be 5,000 people or 7,000 people. If it's two or three, that you say, this is who I am. Let's journey together. <coughs> because life is going to happen. Life is messy. You are going to struggle. Your relationships are not going to be perfect. Someone in your life is going to die. Your body will begin to fail you. Others will disappoint you. You will fail yourself. Your addictions, your mess will come up at the most least likely time that you think. All of these things, and our natural tendency is to run to the cave, and God says, run to me and run to me. I love you. I still don't sleep at night because I love you. And I don't want you to struggle. I don't want you to suffer without knowing that there's greater hope in Jesus Christ. But I do not want you to think that because you come here and we smile and we check off boxes, that we've done our God thing, that he's gonna ching, oh Chris, you've done it, so I'm gonna bless you. And you're not gonna have struggles, that's not how God works. God says, I will join you in this mess. He was God incarnate and he joined and he did life with us and he experienced it so he could say to us, I understand that our great high priest, when we bow and we worship, he can say, I understand your mess, I've seen it, I've experienced it, your temptations, I've experienced it. I know. And I want you to know that I'm going to walk with you. And that's what separates our God from all the other gods. Is that he drank the cup of wrath and he suffered for us. That's our king. That's our priest. That's our God. Let's pray. Dearly Father, I thank you for who you are. And I thank you that you love this mess. This imperfect church family, this imperfect pastor, this imperfect group of people that are in pursuit of you. That are in pursuit of sharing the love of Jesus Christ with our neighbors that are in the midst of struggling and suffering and do not have the hope and the joy of Jesus Christ. But that's a whole other level of darkness in the cave. To not know that God is in the cave with us and will lead us out if we just listen to his voice. That our neighbors, so many of our neighbors, don't know that God wants them to walk out of the cave or even know that he's in the cave. 
Father, this week, may we just be praying for our neighbors. Father, this week, if we're suffering, may we tell someone. May we find a counselor. May we find a group. May we find a doctor. May we just worship. May we, maybe this week, for the first time in a long time, we start our day on our knees. Saying, God, I need you. Change our perspective. Pray as if everything depends upon you. Because it does. May you be honored in the midst of our suffering this week. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
and helpers. You might drive yourself hoo -hoo with the VBS songs. They get stuck in your brain. And when the big week is finally finished, you might even collapse into a VBS induced coma. But well, you do it anyway. You go the extra mile to learn every kid's name, play every game, sing every song, and teach every Bible story. Not because it's fun. It isn't always fun. Not because it's easy. It isn't always easy. Not because you have to. It's easier to not do VBS at all. You do VBS because it's worth it. Sharing the gospel with kids is always worth it. Help us make this summer's VBS a success. Sign up today. Oh, I did pretty awesome that time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, immediately following this service in the fellowship hall, we are going to have a VBS meeting. If you want to come and check it out, VBS takes a lot of people, and it does not happen by accident. It happens intentionally, and we need lots of people. So come and check it out. No commitment. You can come and see what's going on. Sign up if you have a certain area you want to serve in, whatever that may look like. So come and be a part of that today. We're immediately following. Uh, also, some, a light lunch is going to be provided, so uh, you don't have to worry about rushing out. Uh, worship Jam is going on tonight from 6 to 8. If you have any musical talent you want to come and be a part of that, we'd, uh, we invite you to come and, and come and sing, come and play an instrument, whatever it may look like. It's pretty informal, but uh, I would ask you to talk to Anna before you come. If you just show up and try to play, it may be a little bit harder, but if you arrange with her kind of uh, what that's going to look like, and, or if you just want to come and just sing in the background, that's okay too. Uh, but uh, come and be a part of that tonight. Uh, our Puerto Rico meeting is going to be happening right after this service in room 132, so go and check that out. And then, uh, just so y'all know, uh, we're running a little bit late. If you want to stay and sing one more song, we have one more song for you. If you need to slip out, please feel free to go and check out those meetings, do those things. But thank you for being here today. But we're going to sing one more song, Mighty Warrior, if you want to stay for that. Feel free to move if you need to, but let's all stand. We're just going to worship our way out.